Thank you so much for joining us. This is Expressions of Black Beauty. And we are honoring uh, and having a conversation today about black hair. And um, Nakia Brown, our resident artist here, and myself, I'm Professor Shavika Shepard from Frederick Community College. And we have some beautiful young ladies here who are gonna introduce themselves in a second. And we are going to be diving into um, expressions of black hair. We're gonna start talk with talking about our journeys. So each person will introduce themselves and um, talk about their journey, uh, their hair journey. And so I'll let Nakia start. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nakia Brown, and um, I currently have work on view at the Delaplaine Art Center called Expressions, um, Black Beauty Still Lifes. And essentially, um, all of that work on view is uh, sort of a interpretation of my own experiences um, as through girlhood, through womanhood, um, and sort of like how that has shaped the way I understand myself. And so uh, my hair journey really begins um, super early. Um, I got my first perm when I was six, so pretty young and um, continuously would get like perms um, every four to six weeks. Uh, essentially, my mom was my hairdresser. She was the person who I grew up um, emulating and like kind of shaping my sense of identity, my mother, my grandmother, and my aunt. I would say those were like the three women who I sort of um, looked to when I was sort of tr trying to identify and define myself. Um, and so I would say right around the time that I went off to college around uh, 21 was the first time that I um, like made a transformative decision. And it was at that time that I like cut all my hair off and had um, decided that, you know, I wasn't going to do any more um, perming. I was going to kind of stick to protective styles and wearing my hair natural. And so um, I've lived through a lot of different like salon experiences, whether the home or whether um, just kind of like going in and letting someone do it professionally so it looks good. So I've worn afros and, um, you know, twists. And right now I, I've cut my hair short and I've worn weaves and braids and um, cornrows. And um, I really was able to um, find my sense of self and like my hair has always been a way of sort of articulating what that meant. So my hair journey, um, I'm pretty, I'm feeling, I'm feeling pretty nostalgic today. Um, I'm here in Atlanta um, with my grandmother who is transitioning. And um, I had, I felt that I still wanted to do this today because I wanted to honor her because she is the major aspect of anything that has to do with my hair. Um, my mother brought me to her when I was five to perm my hair and because she said she couldn't do anything with it. It was just curly and all, just out of control. And my mother, uh, she got, she's tired of high combing it. <laughs> so she took me to my grandmother. Uh, she had a beauty salon on Candle Road for many years. Uh, I spent many years waiting to get in her chair um, when she had a break between clients. And um, I had every style you can possibly imagine. Every star that came out, the Salt and Pepper, Mary J. Blige, the Tony Braxtons, like I had every single style you can think of, uh, except a Jerry Curl. I never ventured into the land of the Jerry Curl. Um, and so I think around 2021, I was in college. I was at the HBCU when I um, decided to go natural. Uh, before that, it was always like, my hair has to be bone straight and I had to get a touch up whenever, <laughs> whenever it looked like a curl was forming. And so um, my hairdresser at the time said, you know, you have a pretty good grade of hair. Why don't we try it? And so I let her cut it off and my boyfriend at the time went berserk, um, but he got over it because I had a cute head, I, I was told. And so um, from then on, uh, I still went back and forth. Um, in the far picture to the left, the black and white one, I was actually going to Dominicans for a while. So I was still natural, but I was letting Dominicans do my hair and it's a hot, heated process. Um, but again, I've had every single style and my current style is the COVID cut because <laughs> I just, you know, didn't want to do anything with it. And so I just told my husband to shave it. It's just 
take it all off. I don't care. It'll grow back. Um, and so that is my hair journey. It's been an up and down roller coaster. Hello, everyone. My name is Monique McCready. Um, I have been, let me see, my first perm was when I was 11 when I moved to Georgia. Before that, we were press and curl queens. I'm originally from Los Angeles, which is like the home of the press and curl. So you spend many a Sunday on your mother's chair in the kitchen, and that's just what we did. And um, my mother used to be one of the moms that used to braid the M's into your hair and the swirly style. So between that and pressing until I was 11 when I had my first perm. And after undergrad, before I went to grad school, I was like, oh, you know, I want to do something new. Chopped it all off. And I have pretty much been natural ever since. I've gone through every wave. See, now I have the two-strand twist, um, I'm Bantu knots, uh, cornrows, braids, just all sorts of different tunnels of natural hair expression. Wearing that picked out into a fro, you know, putting different stylers in it to get different textures. And um, that was, I think, 2002 or three. I did my big chop and we've been on the natural road ever since. Greetings, greetings, everyone. Peace. I am Shanika Stanley. My hair journey was absolutely amazing. I don't know if you remember the bigger role. I remember my aunt trying that. <laughs> I remember <laughs> in kindergarten, all my aunts sitting against the couch, putting down plastic because of the jerry curl. So I knew that I didn't want a jerry curl. I was very clear. As a <laughs> child, I was not going to my first, second, or third grade class with a jerry curl. So I chose the bigger role. I went from the bigger role to a relaxer. Everybody remember cream of nature? Yes. yes. Cream of nature. <laughs> cream of not my nature. <laughs> Wasn't working out. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed the short term excitement of having hair all the way down my back, just to say I had long hair. And then one day it began to shrink, you know, that new growth and shrink a little more every year to the point where mm -hmm. you hardly any hair and mm -hmm. hardly any perimeter, what we would call edges, gone, absolutely gone. So in this picture, <coughs> this, um, this collage is actually shows what happened once I became an adult. Once I left home, something that's significant, I'm hearing the synchronicity of 21. That's when I started my natural hair journey. But I took a different route. Instead of coming out of the relaxer, once I, you know, I had to try to weave, you know, going to a Caribbean carnival, because I, you know, I had to, I thought I had to have my good hair. Not knowing I had good hair. Right. So mm -hmm. I decided to lock my hair. I decided no more nails, no more contacts, no more weaves. I know you, those that know me are like, what? Yes, me, I know. It was a transition that I was ready for. It changed my life. How I ate, I began uh, to do yoga. Now I'm certified years ago. I went from locks, not knowing my actual texture. Who knew I can do a wash and go? Who, know, who knew that it would look good? Who knew I had a cute shape head? Yeah, I had one of those. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's girl. Important. Yes, that's so very important. important. <laughs> Cutting the locks, and then as you see in the picture, when I have on the all black, I had to do a show that weekend, and I remember getting on stage, and I had nothing to hide behind, and it was so mm. significant. There were no locks to cover any flaw. The camera caught me from all angles, and with full makeup, I got on that stage, and I seen my entire face when I looked at that video, and I looked at myself proudly and said, "Wow." That's where I need to be. And that transition can continue to go. You see in the pictures, I became very comfortable wearing my hair from the different colors and all of the many different cuts and shapes and styles. That was my hair journey. Um, hello, everybody. I'm just Shay. Um, I'm a hairstylist, a makeup artist, and a model. You all might not agree with everything I have to say, but um, I would say I had my first relaxer at the age of maybe like 11. I was in the sixth grade. Um, back then, my mom used to do my relaxers. Prior to the relaxers, I would get, um, you know, the hot comb, the grease, the pops in the neck, all of that, <laughs> and braids. So um, we got the relaxer. It definitely helped with maintenance. I experienced a lot of damaged hair. I started working at a Dominican hair salon called the Hair Company USA. Um, my cousin owns it, and 
there all I see is naturalistas. I see women hair down to their waist. I see girls who get upset when they don't see their curl pattern anymore. And I see a lot of women who really care about their natural hair. So that was like my first real invitation to natural hair. It was very surprising to see so many people in my area with healthy long hair. So when I seen that, um, I decided to go natural. So I cut my hair. I'm also a trendy stylist. So I'm very much with trends. Um, like right now, edges are a thing. Like everybody have to have their hairstyle with some type of fleeky edges. A lot of hairstyles that are trending now are very sleek hairstyles. So at the moment I was natural working at a Dominican hair salon. So I would be constantly getting silk presses um, just to achieve the look I want, whether it be a ponytail or maybe I'm doing a leave out or maybe I'm just wearing my natural hair and I just want it to look and be easily maintained. So after always getting silk presses, that really did put some wear and tear on my hair as well. My hair was extremely damaged. So back in September, last September, I did another big chop. That's the very first picture that you see towards the left. But I had on to my natural hair for about six months. And unfortunately, I came back to the realization as to why I was getting the silk presses, maybe as to why my mom was putting relaxers in my hair. My, I have four Z hair. I don't have four C. Not Z. I have four Z <laughs> Okay, so my hair is the kinkiest. My hair is the driest. I can moisturize my hair right now and tomorrow it will feel like nothing's in there. Um, and when I did my big chop, it was during the winter months. So it was a lot drier outside. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I just, I'm, I honestly was not happy with the results. Honestly, I do hair, I do makeup, and I model. So I feel like personally, my hair is the type of hair you need time for. Like, <laughs> my detangling would take at minimum an hour and 30 minutes. Like, it's just extremely coarse, extremely tight. So with all that being said, I ended up doing another relaxer <laughs> maybe about three months ago, and that's when I got my finger waves. And um, right now, um, I'm loving my relaxer. I haven't had any breakage. I haven't had any damage. Um, I'm pretty much more experienced with hair myself. I'm keeping up with my deep conditioners. I'm keeping up with my protein treatments. And I love my natural hair. I just didn't have the time for my natural hair. Not only did I not have the time for my natural hair, the styles that I wanted to achieve weren't achievable with my natural hair or they would only last a day before it's frizzy again or you know I have to do it again or maintain it. So same thing as me keep putting heat in my hair, it got damaged. So here's my, here's where I am now. It's so funny you said uh, you might not agree because I don't right. think it's really about agreeing. I think it's about what you're comfortable with, what, um, what you feel good with. You know, if you don't feel good with a natural, you don't have to be a natural. I hate when, I hate when people pit us against each other. Like we have yeah. to be one or the other. You, you are who you are. One quick question. Can we explain what 4C hair means for those of us who are watching who <laughs> have no concept of what that means. Fourth hair is supposed to be the coiliest, the tightest coil hair. There um, is a lot of negativity tied to having hair that's when we think of the, the scale of color of, of hair being, you know, what is curly, coily, and how coily. It's like the coilier it is, the harder it is to deal with. And um, actually, honestly, when you think about texture and how the different layers of the hair make up that hair strand, uh, curly hair actually is extremely soft. It's extremely soft. And that's where we get the immense tangles and the knotting and um, somewhat being hard to comb. It's usually linked to 
for the products in which we use. And there's almost a product for everyone, if, if I can say that. For C and anything else that's for, it normally doesn't have a very good, you know, uh, view when you think of, oh, good hair. But in actuality, like I said, it is the strongest hair. It's very soft and very easy to deal with. In, in most cases, our parents didn't know how to deal with it. Our grandparents didn't know how to deal with it, um, most of our community. So therefore, by the time we become adults, we're still trying to catch up, experimenting with it. And in most cases, we can't figure out how to deal with it. We have to figure out where we are in a season of life and what works for us. And that's where we get into, do we do our blowout? Do we do our relaxer? And we follow where we need to be for that moment of, but 4C hair is not bad hair. Not bad hair at all. I didn't hear about like hair having, you know, this whole ideology of a one, two, three, four, whatever, that whole scale. I didn't hear about it until a few years ago. And I automatically went back to learning about it when I was in, in school, my, in grad school, as when we learned that the curlier hair, the tighter coiled hair is a stronger, it can handle more tensile force, handle more strain, as opposed to, you know, whatever, being coily, tight, whatever, bad hair. I learned it in a medical terms, it's a stronger type of hair. That's why you have it, your hair is coilier on areas of your body that need more protection for most people, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's the way I learned about it. So I had a very, I always like cringe when I hear, oh, this type, that type, 4C, this is good or bad, because medically there's reasons for those things. Biologically, there's reasons. So let's talk about the state of black hair. Like why is hair so political, right? What, when we talk about black hair, we wanna talk about texture and things, but then it gets to be a political discussion. So the most recent one being the state of black hair. Um, so have you seen the, have you heard the commentary behind the L magazine cover um, resembling a Piccaninny and then why would we, um, and I love, 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 love Tracy Ellis Ross, like she is my girl crush all day. Um, but people were having issues with her being the, um, the leader of this discussion of, of the state of black hair and she's mixed. I feel like we live in a time where black women, black men are constantly excluded out. Mm -hmm. So whenever we know that something originated from us, like we want to claim it totally. Um, I get that she's mixed and personally, I don't have an issue with that or an issue with her being, you know, the model, but um, I have seen that a lot lately or hear a lot of people speak on situations like that. Like I was listening to the radio and um, they were saying that Somebody from here had two Jamaican parents, so that would make them Jamaican. But another Jamaican said, well, you have to be born in Jamaica to be a Jamaican. And I'm just like, right? It's just like, <laughs> we, if you go down the line, it's- Constant kind of separation. Of, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of all the same, but it's, it's just like, I feel like, so many races, like, if it came, if it originated from there, we want to claim the title of it. Like, now, um, a lot of Caucasian women are wearing braids, and I see a lot of people getting upset about that. Like, why are they wearing braids? And that, you know, that's a Black girl thing, and it's just a hairstyle. So, I truly believe that might be what it is, and because she's mixed, um, I guess, she wouldn't be considered fully black. So I guess that's, I guess that's the issue. I think I struggle, I struggle with that too, because, you know, knowing, you know, we're army brats, Shamika, right? So you know many different people from many different places that have many different types of hair. And so I, I do struggle with the ideology that, you know, black hair is one thing or one way because for every 20 black men, women, children that I know, I can see 20 different hair types, you know? It's not all one way, it's not all this or that. She is biracial, she, has, she is from two different backgrounds. 
um, her hair, maybe a little curl. I've, and I've seen her with like her hair is a lot of different consistencies depending, like most of us, depending what we do to it. So um, it didn't bother me that it was, you know, her who I love, I heart her to pieces. Um, it, I just, you know, you look at it and you need, for us, it's a trigger almost because, you know, it's, it's a representation of something that is hurtful and that was meant to be hurtful and harmful at a certain time in history, right? So it was, I really, it, to me, I don't think it would matter who, what, when, and how was doing it, just that the fact that it was even done and someone thought that it was okay. And then my devil's advocate side, you know, the other side of me was like, oh, well, maybe this is a way of them saying like, this is what it was, let's show you what it really, this is what you think it is, let's show you what it really is, you know? Like I had that same kind of, kind of thought process with this. And I still like, I don't understand, like uh, there was a, a slide, maybe we'll get to that in a second about how they have to approve someone to not discriminate about hair. Like this is kind of falls into that, that same category for me, how you see something or you see someone's crown, because I call everybody's hair a crown, right? It's on top of our head. It's, you know, how we express ourselves. You see someone and we're so used to being divisive and putting something into a category that we immediately think about the category before anything else. I definitely wanna add on to all of these wonderful perspectives. We have to definitely keep in mind, um, just like there are many shades that we come in, there are many different genera generational makeup um, of who we are, whether it's second, third generation from a biracial couple. You never know, when someone sits in my chair, I usually see several different textures. It tells a beautiful story, a, a uniqueness as to who they are. And it can be personified in many different ways. Um, how they choose to express that uniqueness can come in many different art forms. I look at this cover of this magazine and it can mean many things, depending upon how I perceive it, not knowing what she's meaning in her you know, her whole entire persona that I see on this magazine cover. Um, most times when we see something that is connected to something that's negative in our past as Black people, it's automatically looked at as something very negative. And we tend to lose some of the, um, some of the content that really should be discussed. And looking back at our historical um, pictures and stories and, and tying those together to remind the generations that we have now of what had you know happened and where we are now and where we're going so i just hope that with what we're seeing those those conversations aren't getting lost that we're still looking at things from a uh, more in generalized perspectives because i know many sisters who are uh, beautiful dark, dark, beautiful sisters. I mean, dark, beautiful skin. When you see their skin, you just like, you have to have makeup on. And you have no idea who their parents are. And you see their parents and you're just like, wait a minute, what? Wait, this doesn't make any sense. Or you see someone and they have the, um, the tightest, curliest fro. And, and then, you know, I, I might have a child in my uh, styling chair and their parent, their grandparent walks in and you go, wait, what just happened? So you just never really know. And I, I don't feel as though, um, I hope she doesn't have to pay attention and deal with too much negativity associated with her background because she didn't ask for her background. And at the end of the day, mm -hmm. she's a black woman. To interject really quickly, uh, but first of all, when I said something, when you said that, um, it made me think about the episode of Blackish World where Dre told her she wasn't black. Uh, and he, she said, well, somebody tell my hair or my ass that. <laughs> <laughs> because they don't know, apparently. So yes, definitely. Um, anyone else want to add to that? I do feel like um, in this present moment, though, there has been a lot of, um, like in terms of looking at the media and looking within fashion, there's been a lot of um, like looking to African traditional braid styles and sort of like this like re- and like re-engaging with like the Afro pick as like this form of expression and like just to kind of um, piggyback off of Mika, just understanding 
you know, amidst of all of these images of black women and black boys and like black beauty and black men that are sort of like circulating, it's really important that we sort of think about the history, not even just like the racist history that comes out of it, like that's important too, but then also thinking about how like we as a collective black community, how we reclaim these and we make them something that is like central to our um, sense of being empowered. And so, um, you know, if I looked at that L cover initially, I probably would not have in immediately thought of the Piccaninny. Mm -hmm. um, but now that you put them side to side and contextualized it that way, I definitely can see it. But um, I was also just thinking about the way that our hair like defies gravity and sort of like embracing that characteristic and like looking at the pick and thinking about the symbolism of the pick. And so, um, Again, we all just kind of come to these images with our own biases. Um, but I, I do think that when we're able to have dialogue, like as long as you're able to pull out just some like the historic background, whether it's good or bad, or just like understanding how we are like reclaiming these characteristics and like reclaiming some of these symbols as like our own forms of expression and empowerment. I think that like that is also really important to consider. Did you guys, um, add, like, I was looking at uh, some of the quotes from the article, because I don't remember the article. I'd be lying if I said I did. But um, one of the things she was saying was, like, if you could, you know, if our hair could tell a story, it would tell the story of our legacy. Mm -hmm. So she, that's exactly what she was trying to apparently portray from this picture was, like, you know, you have no idea how, you know, how, what our hair can do, what it's capable of. Like, you know, you judge based on this one thing, but our, like you said, our hair defies gravity. Mm -hmm. You know, it, absor it, it absorbs the sun. Like she was just talking about kind of like, you know, all of the things that it can do that some people say it can't do. So I think that's kind of like the, the angle she was coming from. Like, yes, it could stand up. You look at this and think one thing, but we think another thing or we have another thing. Right. And I wanted to add to that a little bit. Um, when we think of about dinkery symbols out of West Africa, the duafe, um, that symbol of the pick, it represents beauty. So the first thing I looked at without looking at the, like really tying in the other picture, um, represent, you know, some negative aspect in our past, which we should know of and be knowledge of because we are uh, people of African descent, regardless of who our parents or grandparents are or great grandparents. I thought of beauty. I thought of her embracing her beauty and saying, no, I, I don't care that it's not perfect. Um, very similarly, remember, I don't know if you all remember, like when Solange came out and she had this like uncombed fro and everybody like, why would she do that? And it was just like, she was like, you know, take it or leave it. It's beauty. So I thought about the Duafe and I thought about this picture tied to beauty in many ways and her just saying, you know what, take it or leave it. It's me. I want to piggyback off that too, honestly, because just like um, what Shamika said, I really didn't fully look at everything. I have um, your pictures on the side, very small. So I didn't really see the entire thing, but now looking at it, I kind of do have a problem with her <laughs> being on there. <laughs> um, honestly, because when I look at the other picture with the black face, um, I, I really find it almost like the ownership thing I was talking about earlier. And this is when I chime in because it's like, why couldn't you, honestly, I could tell her hair is not doing that on its own. Mm -hmm. And um, it looks very Photoshopped. Um, her hair will hang. So if, if in fact, like I said, I'm not really sure what exactly this is selling, but if in fact it was supposed to be like a representation to the picture towards the right, I'm trying to understand there's plenty of models out here with hair that would stand up on its own. Mm -hmm. And it's plenty of celebrities and people with 4C hair or 4A hair or hair that will have that effect on its own, where it's like you're taking someone's hair who's not like that and making it like that which is, I'm not, 
going to say it's a problem, but I just don't, I don't really understand what they're trying to sell in the picture. Like if they're trying to give like a reflection of the picture towards the right, it's just like, why couldn't you do it with someone whose hair is naturally like that rather than trying to find your best model and make it like that? Almost like, it's like when they, when they promote us sometimes, it's, it's to be looked at negatively. Um, like almost like the H&M shirt and they had the, the little boy shirt. And you wouldn't see them put a monkey on <laughs> another ethnicity shirt. So I'm trying to figure out if you were trying to sell this image towards the right, which I'm assuming, I'm not really sure, why couldn't you just find someone who literally fits that description? I don't know. So I just looked up to see um, some more context of the article and why it was in Elle magazine. So apparently Carrie Washington interviewed her about her hair journey and her hair care line because her hair care line just turned one year old. So that is like the context of why she's on the cover of Elle for, I think it was all related to like um, her hair journey and um, them talking about her dealing with her hair as she, as she grew up. So they, it's like a, a whole editorial shoot that they did with this particular thing. And so, and so like most things, people pick out like what, <laughs> right? And then make a right. the big deal of it. Okay. Right, they could have put any of those beautiful, there are some really nice, beautiful, like different, as equally as beautiful as, as this, but like there's other photos in the editorial with mm -hmm. pictures of her hair in braids and her hair, like there's a lot of different looks for yeah. this particular article. Sometimes we have to think about, um, like when you think the concept of, of popularity with branding, whether it's negative information or connotation or positive, it's about it, that whatever it is, screaming out and getting the attention, that picture caught in, caught attention. And when we think about different types, definitely from stylists to stylists, because we have some stylists up here, you know, we think about different ways in which we get into our businesses. Some of us are platform artists, some of us have done editorials. When you get into print work, it can be extreme. I mean, crazy stuff. You're curling and braiding here, there's wire in it, there are different uh, fabrics, anything to make it stand up, look like it's blowing to the side, whatever it is to personify a type of art. Um, but it, we do have to keep in mind that we do not make the ultimate decisions all the time as to yeah. what goes on the front of these magazines. Okay, well, let's move on, thank you. All right, so the business of black hair. Nakia, you want to? Not yet. Um, <laughs> so I thought that a lot of um, the topics that I was thinking about kind of relate to some of the creative things that I do with my photography. And the business of black hair is like this billion dollar, billion dollar business. And so I thought it would be um, good for us to kind of dive into, well, where's the money at? And then like, how are we capitalizing on that? Um, and so I wanted to play this clip and so we can just like hear some of the numbers and then I wanted us to kind of like dive into the business here in America of like black hair. The market research firm Mental values the black hair industry at $2.54 billion. Oh, wow. But that estimate doesn't include hair accessories, wigs, weaves, extensions, electric hair care products, hair care services provided in salons or by individuals, or products sold through salons. If the data included these products, the $2.54 billion figure would be much, much larger. Wow. So $2.54 billion. That's just Goodness me. I, yeah, I can't even wrap my head around like the, quant the qu I can't even quantify that much money. Um, but we I might have a billion dollars <laughs> under our uh, a product under our cabinets right now. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I was hoping we could kind of talk a little bit about that. Um, the video opened up just talking about the amount, amount of money that, you know, we spend on our hair. And I think on average, um, the the women that they interviewed, they were at Curlfest in New York, which is like this large collective 
black awesome. women who come together and we just celebrate all hair textures and types. I've never been, always wanted to go. Um, but they, they, I mean, the amount of money they spent was thousands in the thousands on like salon appointments, products, um, just maintenance, just all sorts of things, just like invest, investing in that. Um, and so I was hoping that those of us who are on the call, who are like in the industry, um, if you can kind of explain or introduce your business and like the model that you are using as you are a part of this like billion dollar mega industry, just wondering like how you are finding your place within it. Like I said, I am a trendy hairstylist. I, I try to stay in trend with a lot of things, but I'm also multi-talented. Um, so I do makeup as well. So if I'm at MAC, um, I find that a lot of women, and it blows me, I find that a lot of women don't know how to line their lips or they don't know how to draw on their brows. And in my mind, I think that it's 2020. <laughs> Everybody should know how to do this. But there's literally people who have no idea how to do this. So with that being said, it's the same thing with hair. It's pretty much the same thing. And I've learned that myself when I try to go natural. I might know a lot of I might be very familiar in a lot of different categories with hair but the natural hair like I know how to style it but like the washing goes and all of that like I'm completely lost where some people women have it down pat so when I um when I'm promoting my hair or my makeup or I'm branding myself typically I do go with what's in style Right now, I do see that um, braids are in style. Braids are always in style during the summer because it's a protective style and don't nobody want to do their hair. Mm -hmm. so, braids are always in style during the summer, but this year, I think it's more than that. I think it's more than just the weather and it being hot. Um, you see a lot of celebrities wearing braids now. Like Braids is just making a huge comeback. So um, I'm focusing on that right now. Nobody is really doing silk presses in the summer. It's hot. They'll sweat it right out. So that's something I'm going to focus on in the winter time. So I pretty much like brand myself with whatever's trending or whatever makes sense in the particular time period we're in, like um, within the year. Sounds like you don't just do hair. Like yeah. you also do like makeup. It's like full beauty experience. So mm -hmm. you're really like taking care of the woman fully. <laughs> uh, my model, uh, I would say really represents my journey. Initially being forced to do my siblings hair and um, some of my clients just laugh at me because some days I have my days on fighting hair. I'm like, I think I should do something else. <laughs> And they're just like, yeah, she's like, yeah. <laughs> 17 years, she's still, they just sit there like, whatever, we'll see you next in two weeks, right? <laughs> and I started out with, you know, the parents, like, you better do your sister's hair. And I'm like, why? I want to I wanna go out, you know? So she's senior high school, you know, I got things to do. Transitioning into, here you go, in high school, wanted to do dual enrollment, you know, college, that whole dual thing became popular. And I decided to go to Paul Mitchell through the community college. And it actually, I went there and I'm glad I went there. It gave me more insight um, as to what hair was, what was it made of, you know, what's keratin, what are the different layers of the hair, what was in dark hair versus lighter hair, the anatomy behind it, getting into scalp disorders, which I kind of quietly fell for trichology and didn't really quite know the terminology behind it, what it was, and could I actually go to school for it. So I end up getting into um, more of the hair care part of it, and I just continue to grow in that aspect. Um, getting into the early 20s, moving into the DMV, you know, having a, a daughter of my own with beautiful uh, 4C hair, and learning what that meant and just constantly implementing that more so in my brain, changing my life, the way I ate, the way I thought, you know, start reading more, I got into health and wellness from the yoga aspect. So my brand is hair and health, literally, that's what my business is called, it's literally called hair and health LLC. It literally is a full journey of all that I went through, all that I see, all that I have experienced in the industry, bringing in the mastered cuts that I learned from Paul Mitchell, because you couldn't make a mistake on Caucasian hair, you see a line, literally. 
you couldn't make a mistake on one mistake on straight hair. You couldn't make a mistake with color. Um, they could see color because they get color more so than what we do. I learned the value of my craft through going to a very state-of-the-art salon. I remember being scared writing my first ticket because I didn't think my art and my expertise was worth what I was asking. So all of this became a part of my brand. I later um, became very well known in the platform artist industry. I was with several product lines. I've been teaching adults um, and probably young adults in the cosmetology industry for about 15 years. That's been a lot of fun getting on stage. I didn't know that I like to speak. I didn't know I have any kind of gift in it. So I am working on my platform. So I'm a platform artist at heart. Um, in addition to both of those, I have decided to stop become stop practicing as a, an associate of trichology. And now I am fully immersed in the art of tr um, trichology. And I say art because knowing how to really deal with uh, scalp issues will really give you the type of hair that you want the results. So basically my specialty ranges from difference in texture. Um, I walk the clients through that journey and basically letting them know I've been there before. I've seen it before, I've experienced it before and I'm here to help them. So it doesn't matter whether they want relaxed hair, texturized hair, keratin treated hair, whether their natural hair is, is out in the wash and go, is braided, is coiled, I'm here for them and I just try to meet them halfway and walk them along that journey. I do have a product line coming out. I have expanded, I have my own commercial space and I'm looking for stylists and I wanna grow that concept and become a brand that is not afraid to work with our neighboring um, salons and barbershops. I'm, I remember I was, um, I was talking to Mika cause I, you know, I got my hair cut and I was just like, yeah, Mika, I don't know, my hair is falling out on my edges. Like I'm losing hair and I thought it was like post baby shedding and, and then Mika just threw this word like, oh, trick, what is it? This trichology, science of the scalp. And I was just like, what? I just learned so much. I just didn't even know that that was like a whole nother side of this business. This is so dynamic and just so big. There's so many different ways that you could go um, within it. And so I remember, oh, I remember when I first cut my hair, um, and I stayed, I continued being, you know, I stayed being, I was still natural. And then it was about that time for me to like go out and find a job, go out and work. And um, I remember feeling just a lot of pressure for how I was presenting myself, like when I was going on job interviews, like just trying to find something so I could pay my bills. And it was just between me and like other friends, we were all trying to figure out where to work. We were all like, having these conversations about, well, can we wear an Afro on an interview? Like, no, we probably have to like get some braids and get a weave in, or we just need to do something to look a little bit more professional um, or presentable. And so it's so interesting. Um, that was back in 2010, but now, you know, almost a decade later, um, the passing of the Crown Act, which essentially um, the Crown Act stands for uh, create a respectful and open workplace for natural hair. And it's a law that discriminates race-based hair discrimination um, based on your hair texture or um, your hair style. So whether you wanna wear um, locks or you know Bantu knots or twists, just any sort of your Afro, any sort of like just natural hairstyle, it protects you from that. And it was recently passed in Maryland um, so I just thought that that was like, looking how we've come full circle, like we're in a climate where we still need to kind of put laws into place where we can be protected. And I was just wondering if, um, has anyone ever experienced any sort of like hair discrimination? So I am a physical therapist. I have a doctorate in physical therapy and I was in a clinic one day and I walked into the treatment room and it was an older um, gentleman, Caucasian gentleman. And I had my hair full fro, like full out curly girl, pinky girl, whatever you want to call it. She was full out and, and ready. So I walk in, I'm like, hi, I'm Dr. McCready. Nice to meet you. You know, I go into my little spiel about what was happening. And he was just staring with his mouth open. And I'm like, are you okay? Do you need some water? Like, you know what is the problem? And he was like, how do you? How do, you, 
you sure you're a doctor? You're sure you're a physical therapist? I was like, of course, um, I'm here. I got my placards on the wall if you want to read it. Like, you know, I'm official tissue. And, um, but he, and later on, after we go through this whole thing, he was so, he was so like mesmerized at the fact that I had an Afro and I was in the clinic treating him and, you know, helping him. He couldn't, he later told me, he was like, I, I just never seen any, a professional with hair like that is what he said. And it knocked my wig back. I was just really perplexed that anyone would have the ideology that the way your hair comes out of your head is a problem. Mm -hmm. And I, I asked him, I was like, well, you know, uh, where's your hair? I asked him, where's your hair? And he was like, oh, I'm balding. And I was like, oh, has that ever been an issue for you? And he was like, oh, I never thought of it like that. I'm like, okay, I was just wondering, this is how it comes out of my head. Like, if this is going to be an issue for you, I don't have an understanding for that because this is who I am. I was like, um, do you feel better now? He was like, I feel great. Thank you. I was like, okay, thank you so much. Have a great day. Right. But, you know, and it's a recurring thing. Like, when I went natural, I had my first job, and I did an internship there, and my hair was down my back permed. And when I came back the following fall for the job, I, I went natural. They had a big chop. So the whole clinic was like, what? Where's your hair? Your long hair, People get so uh, tied to the identity of someone by what their hair looks like. And I think that that has been a precedent, a precedent over our lives, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was one experience for me with uh, some hair discrimination. Mm -hmm. One do of we several. Tie, do we tie, Mo, to pick it back off what you said that people tie our identity to our hair? Do we do the same to ourselves? Um, Absolutely. How many, how many times have we sat in the mirror because our hair wouldn't, do right that day and cried and or just threw on a hat or I'm notorious for a wrap. I will just throw a wrap on it and you know if it's not cut or if it's they just, are beautiful too. <laughs> yes, I love my wraps. So but how and I have I have pushed the envelope and, and warned them to work just to see what they would say. And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, no one has been bold enough to say anything to me. <laughs> but um, but yeah do we tie our own identity into our hair and I feel that it's really sad that in 2020 we're, our hair is still being politicized um, we have to have a law for you not to discriminate me because right. of something that you said that grows out of my head I have no right. control over that like, it's so nonsensical to me like this is where this is where we start time on right now like this yes is because based on your thing. standard of beauty right my hair right. has to match your standard of beauty well <laughs> my hair doesn't like that so right we're not going with that route. <laughs> That's it. That's yeah. it. So it's, it's always bothered me every time I see the crown. Effect. No, I'm glad that it exists, but I'm angered that it still has to. That it has to, right? Like that mm -hmm. this has to be a policy in 2020 yeah. where we have to still spend time and resources on, you know, you want to be able to stop discrimination on something that is, I didn't, it's not wrong. It's just how I am. It's how I look. It's how I feel mm -hmm. because of your standard and your beliefs of what right or appropriate is. Like it's, it's a professional. Fallacy. Right. Like people get so locked into the fallacy of their beliefs of what the whole American system is built on of a particular set of looks or identity of appropriateness and professionalism. And it's, it's problematic. It really is. This reminds me of two things. Um, the first is my first experience of having a client come in beautiful locks down their back and they were really excited. And I said, you know, it did my shampoo and they were kind of quiet and then they were just all excited. And I said, well, what, what, why are you so excited? I'm seeing a mix of emotions here. And my client just told me, looked in the mirror and said, I have to cut my locks. I said, well, why, why do you have to cut your locks? Are you okay? You need some support? And she says, I got this new job. And I know the only way I'm gonna keep this new job until everybody becomes familiar with me and comfortable with me is I'm gonna to have to cut it. And I was floored, I was just like, like I didn't know what to say. It was just like, you know, just, is this something you really want to do? Is this something you really feel like you have to do? And she wanted to, and you know, as a stylist, I met her halfway and, and gave her what she asked for. but it changed a lot of what I thought on the outside because being in my industry for 17 years, I hadn't had an issue personally. I've never experienced it, but I experienced it, you know, through that client's story. I just didn't understand why it was so necessary for her to change her hair 
um, and, and following that story, there were many, this is around the time where, the, I don't know if you're familiar, like the Bowie area, like it was coming up. A lot of people were coming into the Bowie metropolitan area of PG County. Um, they were getting the new jobs and they were getting their dream house. And there was a lot of transitioning going on with hair and people were falling uh, victims to having to be forced to change their hairstyle. And then second, I wanted to bring up, um, and I know this is not directly relating to the Crown Act, but there are children who are in these dance um, groups and they have to get the hair pressed. They don't want the hair pressed. They're against heat. They're happy being curly and natural and they can't get it braided up. They can't get it twisted up. They have to have it straight to actually uh, show that they're in uniform with everyone else. And it, it really isn't fair. So it seems as though it's this is happening and, and, and we're not even we're not even thinking or taking into account um some of our own elders i had locks down my back for nine years and they're just like you know why would you wear your hair like that you're young don't you want to be successful um at the time i was doing pre-medicine no one's going to take you serious you know with those things in your hair you're going to have to take that out so it seems as though it, it, it comes from family so we don't have the support and then we see it in the children as they um, have these other talents and they want to be a part of things the groups also you know, they deeply embed that into the child's mind. Like you like your hair. Some people are telling you it's good for you, but it's really not because you're not in uniformity. And then you become an adult and you go out into this real world. And I'm glad there is a crown act, but really, why do we really need it? It's not fair that we had to have it, you know, as she mentioned earlier in place just to say, I want to wear my hair the way it grows out of my head. But I've seen all three scenarios and it's, it's absolutely horrible. Yeah, I am. Um... I remember I was going, I was actually, I uh, teach in Montgomery County. I was driving into work. I was listening to the radio and they were celebrating. They were like, we just passed the Crown Act. And I heard Crown Act. I turned the radio up and they were saying that, um, it, you know, in the county of uh, Montgomery County, they passed it. And so I do remember feeling um, a little bit like, wow, in 2020, you know, we still need to have this, but I definitely am glad it's in place because, I just think as a community, like in terms of what we're experiencing and I like our in America within our climate, like like we need to have as many laws in place to protect us and to um you know just allow us to exist. Um so this is shameless plug to myself. Um <laughs> a plug. Um, so this is how, you know, I, I do feel like, um, at the core of a lot of, um, like black men and black women, when we're sort of thinking about our hair and whether we're, you know, doing our own hair or doing the hair of others, there's a sense of like craftsmanship, um, artistry, like it kind of ties back to some of our own cultural connections. And so, um, I just wanted to, I was curious to know if you identify anyone identifies as artists. Like, do you consider yourself an artist in any way? Do you consider like your craft and like how do you go about sort of um, bringing your like cultural background into hairstyling? And so if anybody wants to speak on that, whether you're doing someone else's hair or doing your own, but do you consider, do you consider yourself an artist? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I really couldn't look at it in no other type of way. Hairstyling has everything to do with creativity. Mm -hmm. um, we had, I had a conversation with someone um, probably like a few months ago, and they were just saying how um, a lot of these jobs now, you know, are being taken. You're just able to do things through the computer. You don't need mm -hmm, someone there mm -hmm. to check you out no mm -hmm. more. You could, right. And I sat there and I thought, and I said, nobody can take my job. <laughs> like nobody can take my job because although me and Shamika might do silk presses, my silk press will look different from Shamika's silk press. There's going to be clients who like my silk press. There's going to be some clients who like her silk press. So that's where the creativity comes in because a stylist is just that. Um, everybody has their own style. So with that being said, it will always look different. Um, that's why I feel like doing hair, styling hair is art. It is being creative. 
Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I consider myself an artist. I think the more I grow, the more I add to my brand and what I do as um, a professional in all the areas um, within the field of cosmetology. And art is something you can't price. So, you know, it, it's, it's an open field to do whatever you need to do to bring out the most beautiful qualities in those you work with. And that is what I think also keeps me um, passionate about um, working with women. Um, I work, work with, yes, um, lots of black women, um, but many different backgrounds, many. <laughs> <laughs> never know who you're talking to when you share. Um, so all of these pictures, uh, as I look at it, is, is amazing. Um, it's amazing to think about so much where hair has been, where it's going, um, the many stories. I, I still learn from my elders as to what happened even here um, in the past with hair and how all these secret maps were braided into the hair. And, you know, it's, it's just phenomenal. Hair has been great. But those of us who have um, continue to master the art here beyond our own and get into the industry. Yes, I think we are artists and we channel in some great creativity to be able to serve through art up here. Awesome. Yeah, I definitely, there's like a, um, the way you can go about it, like you can be really and I've just seen um, Shay, I've seen you work and like Mika, the way you work, like you guys do have very, two very distinct styles. So Shay, you got, you hit that on a point, like you hit that right on the nose. Um, but you know, you guys are very intentional and like methodical and like perfectionists, but then you have um, this like intuition, intuitive nature in which we can kind of like talk things through and then you kind of, are taking from here and from your own knowledge and your own experience and you're really making something super unique and that's a lot like how I sort of approach like my photography and the art making I do this kind of goes in with the um with the earlier piece mm -hmm. thinking about um like how what decisions these publications are allowed to make and so you can see they photoshopped the hair off of black women's heads they literally removed the hair i would like to definitely piggyback a little bit on what we talked about earlier when we uh -huh. talked about you asked us about our like what we do in our industry but what's mm -hmm. available i mean in terms of us being authors speakers um writers oh my gosh that that editorial work is an actual subfield within um cosmetology with the art with the art of cosmetology and it can be very extreme. So when you think of like hair shows back in the day, like, you know, cause I heard the hair shows were big. I was obviously too young to be on that <laughs> level of hair shows at that time, but I heard that they like black hair was the thing. Mm -hmm. And the hair shows were huge, a lot, a lot bigger than even when I came on the scene and got into it. So when we think of editorial work, let's also keep in mind when you think of abstract art, how can you hear that? abstract mm -hmm. sometimes hair is really created to match the outfit and the artist that's actually showing you their creativity through the extreme mm -hmm. things that they can do with the hair it's sometimes it loses a lot of its meaning in that process by the time we get to it there was a um we have a schoolmate that went to shinika and i uh high school that does i think it's called is it Bronner brothers oh, the hair show Yes, and he yeah. he does the the section of what the fashion and you rock the runway. They do like a whole backdrop setting, and he has he braids the hair into these amazing they look like peacocks and just just things that are far beyond the imagination when you think of hair. And I'm in thought like I'm like this looking for pictures. Like let me see what he did because it like a cosmetologist is there. They are like one of the purest forms of art, an art of a person, an art of a canvas that is ever changing like it, it's amazing like the ability the, and then like you could see a hairstyle on someone and show them that picture and they're like okay I'm gonna you're gonna look like this but I'm gonna do this and x y and z because they see they have such a vision like it's it, right it's such a different kind of artistry that it, it's amazing like I could I could never do that I, like no it, it's amazing to me like 
how, how a cosmetologist can like, oh no, your cheekbones are high, your chin is angled this way. Let me give you this cut. Let me get, this kind of will look better with your skin tone. You're, you're orangey red, but you know, that, that is, that's artistry in its purest form. Uh, really quickly, how did you handle COVID? I know me, I just cut everything off and kept it moving. I just keep it conditioned and I'm just going on with, <laughs> with my days. But what did you do to get through COVID? First, I was super stressed. <laughs> so I said, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And then I said, oh, wait, I've always wanted to leave the industry. I'll leave. I'll just leave. So I'll do that. And I started to get a million texts. I was like, okay, no, no I, I'm not leaving. And I'm not leaving my like that. And then I decided to one work on self. I decided to read a, a book every week, um, one hour meditation. And I decided to do an acronym for that. And that's what my book would be based on. And so I had to become more grounded spiritually, becoming mostly um, balanced. I needed to um, pretty much excite my intellect and grow and take that time to learn and then physically begin to go out and work out because. We weren't quarantined from going outside of our homes. We just couldn't go in these public spaces with a lot of people. And I think that's something still we should do now for our own mental health. Um, and I deal with people, when you think of crown chakra, hair, that, that whole energy of touching somebody's head, if I'm not working on me, my client's gonna walk away with that energy, whether I mm -hmm. want them to or not. So I had to work on me during that time. So I took advantage of it. People were blowing up my phone. Can you teach yoga online? Can you do that? I said, no, 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 and no. I'm this is my time. So I used it for me selfishly and proudly. I used it for me. And I, I learned to say, no, I'm not doing anything. They're like, can you just do a class on Zoom? No. <laughs> but I did also go down my list as a professional and as a business owner. And I said, okay, what does my brand need? I had notebooks full of ideas. I couldn't implement one because I was too busy physically working. So I did that. And then once I got into the salon, I literally developed a plan, a three-step cleaning system that would keep my clients as safe as possible. And that's what I still use. So I got to do the barber size certification. I guess they want to make money, but there are other products. <laughs> so, you know, I did the soap and water and then I learned that your disinfecting doesn't work unless you properly do that. And then following up with a steamer and, and ordered other machines to help sanitize. Uh, so that's how I've dealt with it both personally and in my business. I cut my hair. <laughs> I cut it. I learned how to crochet during uh, during COVID. I I did um spring twist and then like a curly style, and um, that was a part because I have a strong need to touch my hair. <laughs> so I don't like I've never had anyone else crochet my hair, but I was like, you know what? I learned I learned how to do that. So I. That's what I learned from my hair during COVID. That's cool. <laughs> I'm gonna hate <laughs> me or disagree. <laughs> but um, when COVID first started, um, I didn't get no stimulus, I didn't get anything. So I was still working. Um, I would, the salon was closed. So I was doing house visits. I was not as busy as of course, when the salon is open, so I still had my share of time, but my bills still needed to be paid. Um, I'm very big on faith. I truly, I take my precautions, my hand sanitizer, my mask, everything like that. But I, I I'm, I'm a firm believer in what's, what's going to happen to me is going to happen to me. Um, and was not, it's just not. And I've been great. I've been phenomenal. Um, I did have a lot more time during COVID. So just like Shamika, that was like a blessing in disguise. It really gave me a lot of time. And I will say, um, I did my big chop last September. So around that time was probably the most I was playing around with my natural hair and keeping up with my deep conditioners and just keeping up with my hair because I, I had the time. Um, I was doing a lot of self-care, a lot of math, a lot of <laughs> meditating. <laughs> um, it, was, it was really a beautiful moment. And it's just like, now that I'm back to being so busy, it's really like, I kind of missed it. But yeah, Corona time, I was just really focusing on self-care outside of the few clients I was taking. Really quickly, we can go into talking about hair, but I think you talked about it earlier in terms of our, our children. Um, I know just one thing um, Nikki and I were talking about is that I have two sons. 
One of them, he gets his hair cut regularly by his father. The other one um, has hair down his back. That is absolutely beautiful. People always mistake him as a girl and they always ask what do you want to cut his hair? And he doesn't want his hair cut. He loves his hair, that's his crown and he's gonna wear it until, he, until we're ready to cut it. Uh, even someone who surprised me that said, I'm glad you didn't cut his hair was my father. And I was like, oh, oh okay. <laughs> I didn't expect that one coming from you, but it's, um, so just the, the identity of, of loving his hair, whether it's long or short. Um, and I think you talked about uh, just how we teach our kids to love and appreciate their hair. I feel as though I have two children. I have a, a beautiful little 17 year old who's blossoming into this young lady and I, I've watched her go through her hair journey, which I was actually very surprised. It didn't always match what I put out, I was like, oh my God, what do you mean? You want to weave? What, what are you talking about? You know, um, because trend and social media sometimes screams a little louder than their own community and parents, of course. Um, but she had her own walk and just recently she cut all her hair off. Mm. And um, I'm proud to say is because she made her own mind up. She just cut it off. She said, can you color it? I don't want you to color it. I got this, I'm gonna I'm try this. She found her own gooey goop. I don't even know the brand. And she did her own thing. So when children, when we plant the seeds in our child, in terms of oh, our nieces, our nephews, our godchildren, for those of us who don't have children, um, our community, the children who look up to us, when we show them and we're leading by example and what's coming out of our mouth and what they, when they're around us, when we can control somewhat of what they have around them, it somehow, it will retain and it will show itself. It gets in that subconscious. It will come out later on they do find themselves, you know, regardless of what they choose. They will choose healthy hair, they will choose healthy lifestyle, but they have to see the examples. They have to see them in the books. They need to see the pictures around the house. They need to hear it in the music. It can always be in too much trend. They have to have that balance. And when they get older, it's beautiful. As I said, my, my daughter on her own, she's just like, this is my thing. This is, this is the thing now. And I'm like, that's the thing. Okay, that's the thing. You know, and in my head, I'm like, did I do that? Did that, I don't know if I did that, but I'm proud of her doing that and making her own decision. But I know that I work really hard. She has, I love my hair. She um, red hair love. We watched everything you could think of that had black people with curly hair and afros. We read the books, everything. And it, it does have an impact. So I hope that all of us um, are continuing to lead by example as much as we can when those little people are looking at us. Thank you so very much. Did anyone else want to add something? I think um, a parent's perspective or the way a parent raises their child with how they deal with their hair is super important. Um, I truly believe, I mean, of course we can't let kids do whatever they want, but I'm not sure if you all seen the movie um, Big Daddy. And he was talking to the little boy. He was like, what do you want your name to be? And he was like, Frankenstein. And he would let him dress however he wanted to dress. He went to school with swim shoes on one time. And I'm saying all this to say, I think it's really important to let every child have their own identity. Um, and make their, not necessarily every choice, because like I said, we can't leave all the choices in the child's hands. But feel free to let them embrace who they are, how they want to be, and, you know, whatever style they like, and let them be unique, and let them be themselves, because a lot of times we are not even knowing, but we're training them to think this or that, and that has an effect in your long-term life, because you can grow up, and you can know that what you were taught is wrong or right or you can know that you now disagree with what was said back then but at times it has became so habit that you it's really hard to break that habit so um i really i really feel like every i don't have any kids but i i truly will let my child <laughs> Just be her or his unique self. <laughs> We're not going to go super crazy, but, you know, just be more open. I feel like a lot of parents 
have been raised themselves a particular way. So they have to, they, you know, they do that with their kids, but just be more open and more broad and um, just accepting of whatever it is your child may be. Okay, I think that is a great place to um, stop. <laughs> um, lastly, um, thank you, ladies. I think this conversation was ther very therapeutic for me. Um, as my grandmother uh, transitions, I, I just want you to please say a prayer for my family. Um, and uh, thank you so much for Allow me this time to kind of bless us. Love and blessings to cover you and your family, my dear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To your, um, your ancestors, um, peace to you and your family, and you all continue to stay strong. Thank you.